What's up, what's up? Welcome to Air to Air Jordan. I'm Edward, and I'm bringing you a podcast where we talk about the top 10 most iconic NBA players of the 21st century. Last episode, we talked about Dikembe Mutombo, and now we're here to talk about player number 9. Last episode, I said he played with both Dirk Nowitzki and Kobe Bryant. That player is one of the greatest passers of all time. He paved the way for generations to come with a 7 seconds or less offense. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Steve Nash. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Edward, and I grew up playing basketball. I played, I coached, and I loved watching the NBA, so I'm excited to bring you this podcast. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Steve Nash is a controversial player, mainly because of his two MVPs. You know, people tend to make the argument that Kobe should have won at least one of them more than Nash. And... You know, Nash is considered by some to be one of the worst MVPs in NBA history, except Gilbert Arenas, who thinks it's Nikola Jokic for whatever reason. But we'll get into all of that later when we talk about Nash and Kobe in the 2000s. But let's start from the beginning. Nash is a Canadian basketball player, but a fun fact is that he was actually born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and raised in Western Canada. So he actually wasn't born in Canada, just raised there. He played hockey and soccer growing up, and we actually saw the influence soccer had on his career in the 2005 dunk contest when he threw two alley-oops to Amari Stoudemire. One of them was with his feet, and the other one was off his head, so we saw the influence soccer had. Obviously, you're not allowed to do that in-game, but he found a way to do that, and that was during the dunk contest. Only one American college recruited Steve Nash, funny enough, and that was Santa Clara University. He cemented his legacy in the four years he spent there, from 1992 to 1996. He led them to three West Coast Conference championships in that time and was named the West Coast Conference Player of the Year twice. And he made Santa Clara's all-time top 10 in points, steals, assists. And, of course, we're going to talk about one other category, which he was dominant in, but not known for as much as assists, and that's his free throw percentage. He shot 86% from the line during his college days and only improved in the NBA. In 1996, he was drafted outside the lottery by the Phoenix Suns. He was taken with the 15th pick, and that was, of course, the same draft as Allen Iverson and Kobe Bryant. So there's Kobe once again. For a quick recap of Steve Nash's career, you know, just um, to give you guys a quick recap of where he played, what he did, he spent two years in Phoenix, but he didn't really get going until his third year in Dallas which was the fifth year of his career. He started 70 games in that season. Um, And, of course, he got to Dallas in a draft night trade in 1998, the same day the Mavericks drafted Dirk Nowitzki. You know, many people know about the day the Lakers got Kobe and Shaq the same same offseason, but the Mavericks did the same thing with Dirk and Steve Nash. Nash averaged, you know, anywhere from 15 to 18 points per game over the next four seasons with Dallas and seven to nine assists per game. And then when he eventually returned to Phoenix, he became the MVP we all remember. His points per game peaked in his second year with the Suns at 18.8, his second year after returning, of course. But his assists peaked in his third year at 11.6 per game. And he averaged double-digit assists in seven of his eight years with the Suns. So that was, of course, his prime in terms of being an elite passer, which, again, is, of course, what he's mainly known for. In the 2012-2013 season, he joined Kobe and Dwight Howard on the Lakers. A lot of people remember that because it happened not too long ago. And, of course, the big three never pound out. One of the biggest what-ifs in NBA history. Nash was a little old, and he fractured his leg to miss most of the time with the purple and gold. Dwight, of course, dealt with some injuries of his own, and so did Kobe, so it never really worked out. And then Nash ended up retiring in 2014. Now, for some of his accolades, Steve Nash has reached at least 20 assists in a game eight different times, and that's at least in the regular season. He is one of seven players with at least 10,000 assists throughout his career, and because of that, he's fifth on the all-time assist list with 10,335 of them, behind LeBron, Chris Paul, Jason Kidd, and John Stockton. And he led the league in assists in five different seasons throughout his career, so just a load of accomplishments mainly to do with assists because that was his big thing. But one of the things that made him so difficult to guard, apart from his elite playmaking, was his ability to get to the line and almost never miss a free throw. Uh, His free throw percentage never dipped below 82.4%, which I think is what he averaged in his rookie season. So he only approved from then. And nine different seasons, his free throw percentage was above 90%. 
four of those seasons. He had 50, 40, 90 seasons. That's something not many people probably know about Steve Nash, but because of his efficiency, he was also an efficient three-point shooter too, and so he had those 50, 40, 90 seasons. At one point, Nash made 74 straight free throws. There's only six players who have made more consecutive free throws than that. He also, of course, made eight All-Star teams, seven All-NBA teams, and, of course, the back-to-back MVP awards in 2005 and 2006. Now, as far as how far his team went, he, the Suns finished first in the West in 05 and second in 06. Those were the two seasons he won the MVP, of course, and he shined in the playoffs in those years, averaging over 20 points and 10 assists per game. But in the regular season, he averaged about 16 and, and 12 in 05 and 19 and 11 in 2006. Kobe's averages were way better, which is where the controversy comes in between who should have been MVP. Um, Kobe averaged more than 30 points per game those years, but the Lakers were much lower in the standings, which really hurt the Mamba's case. One of those years, the Lakers didn't even make the playoffs. And as you know, with MVPs, most of the time, it's somebody in the top three in their conference. That's why Nash was the MVP. Now let's take a break from my new segment, The Air's Top 3. We're going to be taking a look at Steve Nash's top three moments of his career. For Nash, some of his best moments came in the playoffs, and even though he never won a championship, that's where he shined, getting to the conference finals a number of times. We're going to start with number three, which is his 23-assist game against the Lakers in the first round of the 2007 NBA playoffs. The Suns won the first two games of the series but lost the third one due to offensive struggles. Nash stepped up in game four and had a 23-assist, 17-point game which got them the victory along with Sean Marion's double-double and Amari Stoudemire's 2020 game. They won game five after that and advanced, but could not beat the Spurs. And we're going to talk about the Spurs later in this segment. They're going to keep coming up again and again. But first, second on the list, we got to talk about his revenge on the Dallas Mavericks. Steve Nash had a rocky relationship with the Mavs. They essentially told him they didn't really need him because Mavs owner Mark Cuban thought Dirk Nowitzki and Steve Nash had done all they could do together. Cuban later said separating them was the biggest mistake he ever made. I don't know if he still thinks that to this day, but you know that's, that's a crazy statement to make because they could have done great things together. In 06, of course, the Mavs made the finals and lost to the Heat, and maybe if Steve Nash was on the team, it would have been different. But, you know, there's a lot of what-ifs. Um, and in 2004, Nash returned to the Suns and faced Dallas in the second round of the playoffs. That's two years before the Mavs made the finals. And... That was the series right there where he proved he wasn't just a great passer, but he was also an elite scorer. He could also put the ball in the basket and lead the team offensively. He averaged about 30 points and 12 assists in that series, which Phoenix won in six. In the closeout game, he had 39 points, 12 assists, and nine rebounds to lead the Suns to the conference finals. He was one rebound away from a triple-double. Guess who they lost to in the conference finals? The Spurs. And so the top moment of Nash's career is when he finally took the Spurs down. He lost to them six times in the playoffs, six different series, before he faced them in 2010. The Suns got to the second round and were able to win the first three games of the series against the Spurs. And they took a one-point lead into the fourth quarter of Game 4, looking to close them out in a sweep and bring out the brooms. But just as they were looking to do that, Tim Duncan accidentally elbowed Steve Nash and his eye needed to be stitched up, and it was almost fully closed. But he returned, played with his eye shut, and tacked on 10 points and 5 dimes in the fourth quarter to secure the sweep for Phoenix. That was, you could say, it was basically his flu game. You know, the equivalent of Michael Jordan's flu game. Um, which has to be his most iconic moment, because he got revenge on the team that, that had his number for his entire career. Um, now, unfortunately for Nash, he was never able to overcome come the hump of the conference finals, and he was never able to reach the NBA finals. So that's kind of where his luck always ran out. And um, so that's one of the things that he will always be remembered for as far as things that he never got to do, which is play in the finals. Um, eerily similar to, um, you know, Chris Paul until, of course, he reached the finals with the Suns. So those were my top three Steve Nash moments. Back to the rest of the podcast. Now, I want to talk about the real reason Steve Nash was iconic, and that's the seven seconds or less offense that he ran with the Phoenix Suns. Because I feel like that's where Steve Nash truly made an impact on the league as we know it. The Suns coach in the 2005 season, Mike D'Antoni, had as much to do with that as Steve Nash. So you got to give credit where credit is due. Basically, D'Antoni had his team run a fast-paced offense that relied on the pick-and-roll to generate offense. 
in the high post. Steve Nash, of course, the perfect player to drive that as an elite playmaker and scorer. So he would either drive to the basket himself or pass the ball to the big man driving with him, usually Amari Stoudemire or somebody like that. Or he would kick it to an open shooter, as somebody like Sean Marion. So he had the perfect guys on his team to run that type of offense. The way the Suns were constructed and given Steve Nash's abilities, they were perfect for this type of system. The fast pace of the Phoenix Suns you know, didn't really allow defenses to get set up most of the time. It seems like the modern-day Warriors have replicated that. Um, you know, teams that have elite shooters have really been able to use that seven seconds or less offense to their advantage. And to make sure that defenses aren't able to get set up in time. And that's exactly why the Suns ran it, because they didn't want to get let defenses get set up. And they wanted to use the fact that they have a lot of quick players and a lot of great shooters to their advantage. And the Warriors, of course, a similar team with all of their great shooters. Now, after his career, Nash became a coach, but was fired by the Brooklyn Nets after... After he took on that, you know, really difficult task of coaching Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant. You know, coaching guys like that would be tough for anyone because that team was player run. You know, they said it themselves. And since then, Nash has been focusing on, you know, his business ventures. He's been growing businesses. He's taken ownership stakes in the Vancouver Whitecaps of the MLS, RCD Mallorca of, of La Liga, the soccer league in Spain, of course. Um, and of all teams, the Las Vegas Desert Dogs, which is a, a lacrosse team. So, you know, he, he has really been focusing on expanding to a lot of sports. Soccer is one that he played growing up, of course. We all know the skills he had in soccer. Um, but yeah, Steve Nash, you know, just a, a legend all around. Unfortunately, never got to win a championship. So far, neither of the guys in our podcast have. But we're going to get to a lot of guys who have won championships, of course. Um, And maybe Steve Nash would have been higher on this list if he did. Maybe that was the one thing holding him back. I think he definitely could have been higher on this list if he led his team to a championship. But even without that, Steve Nash had quite the career, and he'll go down in history for revolutionizing the game as we know it. That'll do it for this episode of Air to Air Jordan. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. Check out my website, airtoairjordan.podbean, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, for more information about me and my podcast, Next episode, we're going to talk about our first NBA champion on this list. As I was just talking about, we haven't had one yet. We are about to. And this player won one championship, and it's the only one his franchise won in the last 35 years. Now, I'm a fan of this player's rivals team, so I love to rub that in those fans' faces that they only won one in the last 35 years, but I hope I don't jinx it. The playoffs are, of course, about to start. We're in the playing tournament right now. But as far as the player in the next episode, he won one championship and is the only one his franchise won in the last 35 years. Make sure to subscribe and keep an eye out for the next episode. See you next time.